I love snow, but not on the weekends. And just think about it, isn't it a number of inordinate times that we get snow on the weekends? I want to thank our staff for um, uh, really working overtime, that's an understatement, to make sure the, the parking lots and the sidewalks were almost ice-free. Um, they really were after it yesterday and even Friday, and I think Thursday night was when we started salting first, so uh, so we could be here. Um, and and when that happens, we're going to try to have worship at if at all possible, but that doesn't mean you have to come. So don't take risks. Um, secondly, this is a special day because um, we're. Uh, performing a service that's been a tradition in the church for many years. It's a remember your baptism service, and we'll direct you through that uh, at the end of the service. Um, um, you'll answer the questions off baptism. We believe in only one baptism, so we don't, we don't baptize people again. But the interesting thing is that if you're here and have not been baptized, answer those questions and would like to be baptized Tell either Bill or me, and we can baptize you at that moment um, um, because you will have answered all those questions of the faith. Let's bow for prayer. Loving God, draw us close to you. Make us one in spirit, one as the body of Christ, for you have much ministry and work for us to do. It's in the name of Jesus, the Christ, that we offer this prayer. Amen. It's a new year, and many times when the year changes, people make pledges to alter their behavior. It might be to stop, quit smoking, or some other destructive behavior in their lives. By far, I believe the greatest number of New Year's resolutions concern taking care of our bodies. Uh, usually those resolutions uh, focus on our weight or uh, exercise or something similar. People who want to get their bodies fit between now and the time uh, later in the year that they'll be wearing revealing summer clothes do it so they might look more appealing makes sense. The human body is an amazing thing. Did you know that your brain weighs about three pounds and operates on the same amount of power as a 10 watt light bulb? I was wondering if this week that's where the term dimwit comes from. <laughs> I'm, I'm weird. I'm Oh well, nerve, nerve impulses run to and from the brain at just under 200 miles an hour. If a human's DNA were able to be uncoiled, it would stretch 10 billion miles, which would be from here to Pluto and back. One person's DNA. The femur is the body's largest bone. It can support 30 times the weight of its owner's body, making it ounce for ounce uh, stronger than steel. Now. Here's an interesting one. Your eyes are the same size they were when you were born, but your nose and ears will never stop growing. Um, I was just thinking of some older people in my family and how true that is. Uh, <laughs> your eyes can differentiate between more than 10 million colors. And your nose, which don't forget is growing right now, um, can remember 50,000 different scents. Here's an interesting one that I learned this week while I did all this silly research. Um, the fingernails on your writing hand grow faster than they do on your, it would be my left, on your non-writing hand. And your fingernails grow four times faster than the nails on your toes. Aren't you glad you came today? Um, <laughs> And speaking of fingers, and this one is amazing to me, your little fig finger contributes over 50% of your hand's strength. Wow. The human body has 500,000 sweat glands on a human foot that produce a pint of sweat a day. 
Here's another one. There's presently in your mouth right now more bacteria than people in the world. Listerine, anyone? Uh. <laughs> the average person pr produces 25,000 quarts of saliva in a lifetime. I've told that that would fill two swimming pools and two closing ones. Every day, every hour, you shed 600,000 particles of skin. Now, that's a lot of dandruff. Uh. And every day, our bodies produce 300 billion new cells. And that's only a starter, and it's amazing. It's no wonder the psalmist wrote, we are indeed fearfully and wonderfully made. Every part had its, has its purpose and responsibility and needs to work together to keep us alive and moving. In our scripture today, the Apostle Paul chooses to use the illustration of our physical bodies to make an observation about another body, the church, the body of Christ. There's the silly story of the hands and the mouth and the teeth of a person talking among themselves one day. They made the observation that they were doing all the work, but the stomach got all the food. And so they decided to go on strike. They quit gathering and chewing and swallowing the food. Immediately the stomach started growling and cramping. But the stomach wasn't the only part of the body to be hurt by their decision. Soon, every body part was too weak to function. Trying to hurt one part of the body hurt themselves and every other organ and body part. That's one take on what Paul was trying to communicate. We are the body of Christ. And our body has many parts, each one of them being essential. I try to go out of my way to, to thank people around here, especially our volunteers. Every now and then, uh, stop and try to compute and realize the number of people it takes, for instance, to produce an effective worship service filled with excellence and glorification to God. It takes literally hundreds of people, from musicians to acolytes to ushers to those who produce the bulletins to golf cart drivers, to pastors, to communion stewards and servers, and that really doesn't touch the service, surface of the people it takes to have us here. And every one of those roles, and many more, is important, so important actually that a worship service as large as ours couldn't be carried out effectively without any one of those positions, all persons by people committed to both Christ and the church. Paul says there are many parts of the body and that they all have different gifts and are all important. Then he says that though they are all unique and different, that the body they make up has one spirit. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body and given one spirit to drink. So how can that happen? How can we be one in body and spirit? Well, I believe it starts with checking our egos at the door. Sometimes when I talk to people in the community who aren't going to church anymore for some reason, and I ask them why, their response is that their church just isn't meeting their needs anymore. While I'm always focused on effective means of ministry, it's my belief that such a concern is more secular and less spiritual, more commercial and less spiritual. We are not in the business of pleasing customers. We're in the business of serving children of God, which is who you and those outside of us are or can be. Many times when I speak with folks who are ready to join the church, and, and I spoke with a lady this morning who's with her husband thinking about doing that, I share with them that I want to make sure they know what they're getting into. Because when they join, I tell them, they lose all of their privileges. And that we expect them to be a part of us and to love with us, and to go to work with us in ministries that produce results that love God and lead to bold worship 
and changed lives. We are baptized into one body. In Methodist theology, two things happen at baptism. We are claimed and we are cleansed. We die with Christ at baptism in order to become new people who can be raised with Christ to new life. You are a loved child of God, period. It's something you can't earn, justify, defend, or demand. None of that works. As we're baptized into one spirit, we're cleansed from all unrighteousness. At baptism, we are saved from hearty individualism that assumes we have to do it for ourselves and are initiated into a body that lives by a new set of values. The old life says things like, take care of yourself because no one else will. Grab all you can before somebody else does. Don't get angry, get even. Consider everyone your contestant or opponent and the one truly with the most toys in life as the winner. New Life in Christ affirms Find fulfillment in losing yourself. Contribute all you can to the community. Forgive as you have already been forgiven. Cooperate and compromise for the good of the whole. And the one who knows Christ is the one who lives now and forever. I'd really like for you to think about that for a moment. Which life, the old or the new, do you find yourself more wrapped up in? Paul says that those who are part of the body build on the external connection that exists naturally as members of the body worship, work, and glorify God together. The body he's talking about isn't just any old body. It's the body of Christ That body reveres and loves God, follows Jesus the Savior, and is led by the Holy Spirit. Interestingly, we most often now call that body the church. The original biblical word is the Germanic term, kirka. But the original biblical term is the Greek term, ecclesia. And the two terms really aren't the same. As a matter of fact, the the term for church comes not from biblical terms, but from the Germanic, Dutch and German word kirke. In Greek society, the term ecclesia referred to a select civil body convoked or summoned for a special or particular, particular purpose. So what then does it mean for us as followers of Christ to be called by the biblical term ecclesia. It's safe to say that they intended to convey the original Greek meaning of the word, which would be translated as a body of Christ followers who were called out of both the Judean and Roman sectors to come together into a separate civil community. It meant a politically autonomous body of Christ followers who served no other king but Jesus. You and I are meant to be this ecclesia. When the early followers were summoned into this community, they became part of a family, which is described in Acts as a people who devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. All believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to one, anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What happened was what was that this body was summoned to follow Christ together, and in so doing it became family and developed relationships. It's obvious that was Jesus' plan, that his followers would follow the model he set with his disciples, that we as the body of Christ would develop solid, powerful relationships, meaningful relationships. So much of what Jesus taught 
was about how to treat one another. Love one another as I have loved you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's obvious that how we treat one another is important to Jesus. It's a family affair. At times, it seems that people tend to treat strangers more positively than they do members of the family or the body. And it is important that we, as the body of Christ, treat people outside the fold well. That was one of God's directives to the Israelites, who rem reminded them that for so many years they themselves were sojourners. Take care of the stranger, they were told. But too, it's important for us to remember the members of the same body, the body of Christ. And because of our common goals of ministry, serving the least, the last, and the lost, and working together to bring others are two to be treated in loving and encouraging ways. Over the next weeks, we're going to be focusing on that. How to treat different parts of the body. How members of the body of Christ should treat one another. We're going to be delving into something that God will speak into an aspect of a relationship that you're currently in and applying it to how we treat one another inside the church, inside the body of Christ. We're going to call it the one another's and talk about how we honor one another and why that matters and how we care for one another and why that matters and how we pray for one another and how that matters and how we love one another and why that matters and how we forgive one another and why that matters and how we encourage and lift up one another and why that matters. It's important because we are the body of Christ, his very hands and feet in the world. And just as there are things we can do to keep our physical bodies healthy and in working order, we too must be fine-tuned as a body of Christ in order to be able to serve and work together in a broken world that is in the need of Jesus. The stakes are high. The life and salvation of those who without him are outside the light. It's all about relationship with God through Jesus with those who don't know Jesus yet, and with others inside the fold whose mission together is to love God and to worship boldly and to change lives. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for leading us to be members of the body of Christ, all with different gifts, responsibilities, roles. It's so important for that body to be fine-tuned and cooperative and encouraging for there is so much work to do in our broken world that's often without light that our expanded impact and influence must be great. So in these coming weeks, as we talk about relationships and how to treat one another, how to cultivate the body, allow us to be honest with ourselves and open to your spirit. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ that we offer this prayer. Amen.